Well, good morning. Uh, it is a blessing to be here with you all this morning. Would you please uh, take your copy of God's Word and open with me to the book of Romans? Or I should say, Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 1. We will begin with verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. Let us give our careful attention to it. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Christ Jesus, to all those in Rome who are loved by God, and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, again, good morning. My name is Mark Capper. As Norman said, I am the pastoral uh, intern of counseling here at First Pres. I get to work with Pastor Josh Squires. He is a wonderful delight. Um, I... Uh, I do have the same name as Dr. Ross, so you get, uh, uh, you have another week away from him, but you're still stuck with another Mark. Sorry about that. Um, I, have, uh, I have two years left here in this internship, but I also have two years left in seminary. I'm enrolled at Reformed Theological Seminary up in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm in a dual degree program there with the Master of Divinity Uh, and also a counseling degree that they have. And so it will take me about five years to complete the whole program, and I'm three years in, have uh, four semesters, two years uh, left. My uh, my wife is with me here this morning, Caroline. She uh, has actually been in Columbia for the last four years. She has just started her fifth year working for Reformed University Fellowship. Uh, RUF, uh, at uh, the University of South Carolina here, and, uh, and yes, uh, and, and Scott works for RUFI here as well, um, thankful for, uh, for their ministry for RUF and RUFI uh, on the campus of the University of South Carolina. Um, Caroline uh, originally comes from Mississippi, I originally come from Maryland, so we are from two very different D- different places of origin, but the Lord has uh, brought us together here in Columbia for this season, and we are very grateful for that. Columbia is a sweet location that really is about uh, halfway in between our respective families, and so it's a, a nice balance um, for us. Even though we're both very far <laughs> from families, it's about nine hours both directions if we want to go visit our families. Um, we are, we're glad to have a, a central location like this and to have the community here um, that, that we do. We have been married for, oh man, seven months, <laughs> seven months already. It will be eight months this, uh, in September. Um, I just... I probably need to just not worry about numbers when it comes to that stuff. Um, so we've been we've been married for eight months. We're uh, we're so thankful for the Lord's kindness in bringing us together. Um, and we're not sure exactly where uh, where the Lord is going to take us after our time here. It's nice to have somewhat of a firm date that we'll be here for about two more years as I finish seminary and finish the internship. But, um, but yeah, there's uh, some uncertainty there as we don't know where the Lord will, will take us after that. But um, 
but we're thankful for this time to, uh, to learn to trust him as we wait for him to provide for what is next. So um, it is a blessing uh, to be here with you all uh, this morning. Now, I promise all of that was totally genuine, but I also did it as an example. What did I just do? I greeted you. I told you my name, my relation to this church, my relation to the class this morning. I told you a little bit about myself, about my wife, about what she does. Um, I connected it back to the class. I gave you an introduction or a greeting. And similarly, in every letter that Paul writes, he inserts a similar sort of greeting to each individual church. Now, Paul's greeting to the church at Rome is the longest greeting of all of his letters. I don't know if you noticed that. Uh, if you've read uh, others of, of Paul's letters closely, um, it took us a while to get through that introduction. That's because it is the longest greeting of all of Paul's greetings in all of his letters. Okay, now something I'd like to do this morning, I don't think Mark usually does this, but it seems like a number of you have your Bibles, so I would actually like to ask people to turn and read aloud some scriptures for us. So uh, could I have a volunteer turn to Galatians 1 and read verses 1 to 3? Maybe this isn't going to work. <laughs> Thank, okay, Galatians um, can I have someone turn to Titus and do Titus 1, 1 to 4? All right, we'll just, we'll start there. Um, so we'll start with Galatians 1, 1 to 3, and then Titus 1, 1 to 4. Thank you so much for volunteering. I appreciate it. Galatians 1, 1 to 3. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised us from the dead. Thank you so much. Uh, so that's Galatians. Uh, now Titus 1, 1 to 4. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth, which records in its godliness, and hope of eternal life which God who never lies promised before the ages began, and of the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with, with which I have been impressed by the man of God our Savior. Titus, my true child, and I come to say, praise and peace from God and the Father, praise Jesus Christ. Thank you both so much. I really appreciate that. So those are, uh, after Romans, uh, Romans is the longest greeting, Galatians is the next longest greeting, and Titus is the next longest greeting. So we see that sometimes Paul packs a little bit of a punch into that uh, opening section. Uh, However, sometimes he's very brief. Uh, if I could get a few other volunteers, 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 1, and 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 1 and 2. Would somebody else be willing to do that? Thank you. Um, we'll start with 1 Thessalonians when you're ready. Paul, Savannah, and Timothy, the church of the Thessalonians, God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. Woo! Man, that was quick. <laughs> All right, so that's 1 Thessalonians and then 2 uh, Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, Paul, Savannah, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. So there are common elements throughout all of Paul's letters, whether his greeting is long or short. Um, first, there is his the, the very beginning of every introduction, Paul. He gives his name. Now, this is uh, something we're not accustomed to. Uh, obviously, 
in terms of a lecture format, I came up here, I told you my name at the beginning of this, so that we're used to that. But in terms of a letter, we're used to uh, the sender of the letter signing their name at the end. But in this time and in this culture, you'd begin by saying your name first. Now, something that I've sort of been meditating on the last few days, and the significance of it really didn't hit me till this morning, is actually how even the name Paul chooses to present here is reflective of the gospel and the beauty of the gospel. And I want to show you why that is. Um, if you turn with me to Acts 13... Okay, I had the right chapter for a minute. I thought I might have misspoke. Acts 13. Okay, I'm going to start at verse 7. So, what, so Luke is the author of Acts. What he's been saying is he's been talking about Barnabas and Saul. At the very beginning of chapter 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 2, it says, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Uh, but skip down to verse 9. It says, But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him uh, and said, and so forth. Sometimes this idea makes its way uh, uh, among us as believers that when Saul the Pharisee was converted, his name was changed to Paul. We see examples of that in Scripture where uh, at a point of conversion someone is given a new name, uh, or maybe not necessarily the point of conversion, but Abraham, for example. He was Abram. And then his name was changed to Abraham. So there's precedent for the idea. But if we read Acts, that's actually not what happens. He is sent out as a missionary with Barnabas using the name Saul. But if you zoom out a little bit, what you realize is that up until this point, Luke has primarily been writing about the mission to the Jewish world. And then... Now what Saul and Barnabas are going to do is to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And what often I think also we, we don't realize is that Saul, even, so our, our New Testaments come from the original Greek New Testament. And, um, and the name Paul is a Greek name, Paul Law. But the name Saul is not. We know of King Saul in the Old Testament. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. So the name Saul is a Hebrew name, or uh, maybe even an Aramaic name uh, at this point. Maybe, it's, maybe it finds its way into both. Um, so Saul comes out of the Hebrew, and Paul is a name in the Greek. Now, the Hebrew language and even the Aramaic language was not a widespread language throughout the world. Greek was. If you uh, look up any seminary's website and go to their language courses, um, where it says Greek, it doesn't always say this, but it should say Koine Greek. What that means is Koine is a Greek word in itself that means common. Um, there, there was the original classical Greek language. That was what uh, Homer and um, the Iliad, uh, sort of like the 600s BC, this uh, refined Greek language was, uh, was classical Greek. But by the time of uh, the, the New Testament, 
uh, it had changed a little bit. It had been vulgarized a little bit. That just means it had become more common um, and not as, uh, as high class, as it were. And it had become a language around the, the known world at the time that it was used. So uh, you might have your particular language that you spoke with your people, but then when you went to the marketplace where there might be travelers, you would speak a different language so that you could interact with them there. And so the transition of Saul from using his Hebrew name to using his Greek name is uh, significant showing that they are taking the gospel of God out of Israel from where it originated and they are taking it to the ends of the earth. Paul is using his Greek name to minister to the Gentiles and, and to the Jews. The Jews, in the, uh, they also spoke Greek too. That, that's sort of the distinction I was making with when... They were in private. Sometimes they'd speak Aramaic with one another or, or Hebrew. But, um, but when they uh, interact at church, probably because the Roman church in particular was made up of Jews and Greeks, uh, they would speak Greek because it was the common language. And so even just seeing Paul start his letter with his name, Paul, he, we see that he's known by his Greek name and seeing that the gospel uh, is going uh, into all the world. Um, okay, so that is one uh, element that is common in Paul's greetings is that he lets people know uh, his name um, and is very intentional in the, in the name that he chooses to share. Another common element is uh, usually found at the end of his greeting. And it's here in Romans as well. Uh, grace and peace. Now, uh, there is one commentator who has suggested that this, um, this sort of blessing that Paul gives is a combination of the common Jewish and Greek greeting. Uh, in, uh, in Hebrew, the, the Jewish greeting was shalom, which meant peace. And in Greek, the greeting was kairē, which actually comes from the word for rejoice, but a, but a word that sounds very similar in pronunciation is charis, which is grace. And so, um, so every day, uh, through people greeting each other uh, in the marketplace, uh, kairē, shalom, well, uh, probably in the, in the privacy of of uh, their Jewish settings, they would say shalom. Um, and so the idea is that maybe what Paul is doing here is he's uh, using the, the Greek word for peace and pairing it with uh, the, a word that sounds like the Greek greeting, hello, <laughs> or I rejoice to see you, and, uh, and he's putting them together into uh, one Greeting, and, and this is what this commentator says. He says, the two combine naturally and beautifully in cause and effect because when God's grace comes upon us, taking away our sins and making us objects of his favor, his peace floods our being. Now I, I present that to you. That is a, that's a beautiful idea. I don't actually know if he's right. Um, and I, I think it'd be difficult for us to say definitively that he is right. But it is a, a fascinating idea and uh, something to think about uh, of taking these two uh, greetings from these two cultures and putting them together to reflect the idea that Paul's going to say is there is no longer Jew or Greek. You are one. You're to be united together. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, of course, the last element is from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a element common to a lot of Paul's greetings. Well, where's the Holy Spirit? We pride ourselves on being Trinitarian, but usually in Paul's greetings, we don't see mention of the Holy Spirit. Well, why is that? Well, maybe, maybe he's actually there in a way that you don't realize. 
See, in our language especially, we've really come to associate the name Jesus Christ as the name of our Savior. Well, in reality, Jesus is his name, and it is who he is. Christ is his title. It's what he is. Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, which means anointed or anointed one, which is also related to the Hebrew word Messiah, which is anointed or anointed one. In the Old Testament, kings, when they were, uh, when the Lord ordained them to the office of king, uh, the prophet would take oil and pour it on the king's head and anoint him with oil. And in the Old Testament, that oil symbolized the presence of God's Holy Spirit coming and dwelling with the king and, uh, and being with the king powerfully in whatever he did. That when you were anointed, you were given the Holy Spirit uh, to, uh, to work through you. And, uh, and in Acts 10, uh, we read of when Jesus was himself anointed. Acts 10, verse 37 and 38. This is Peter speaking to a crowd. He says, You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. What we see reflected here is the aspect of Jesus' humanity. Jesus himself was fully God, but he also was fully man. And that's a mystery that's hard for us to, to comprehend entirely. But what is happening when Jesus is anointed is the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, is coming and empowering his human nature to, uh, to do the miracles and, and the, um, the mighty works that he does. See, Saul, uh, King Saul from the Old Testament, he was anointed. David, he was anointed. The Old Testament speaks of the Lord's anointed. And in a small way, it was talking about the king of Israel. But here, at the end of days, Jesus of Nazareth comes on the scene. And he is the true anointed one. He is the anointed one that all the other anointed ones were pointing forward to. And so here in Romans, as well, and in, in, in all of his letters, when, when Paul says... Uh, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if we were to take that and um, overly literalize it, maybe we could say that uh, and the Lord Jesus, the anointed one, or the Lord Jesus, the one anointed with the Holy Spirit. Um, and so even in this uh, formulation of language. Um, the, the Holy Spirit isn't explicit, but he is implicit. He is there doing, incidentally, what his very role has been given to do, which is to point to Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior. Okay, well, we're continuing on, and I want to hit for just a brief moment, some of the things that if you were here, I guess it wouldn't have been last week, but the week before, uh, some of the things that Dr. Ross laid out that are particular to the book of Romans um, that are going on in Paul's mind as he's writing to the church. For one thing, an issue that, that Paul is addressing is that Jewish Christians, not just in Rome, 
but, um, but broadly, Jewish Christians believed rumors that Paul was not teaching Scripture. And now for them, when they say Scripture, the only Scripture, the only Bible they had was the Old Testament. But it, still, that was the holy texts. That was the holy Scriptures. Um, and these Jewish Christians believed that Paul wasn't teaching the Scriptures rightly. Um, so that's one issue that Paul is writing to address. Another issue um, is that Jews and Gentiles in the Roman church were not getting along. They were experiencing conflict because of uh, how they were choosing to practice uh, their faith. Uh, the Jews still practicing some of the elements of the law in the Old Testament, especially some of the ceremonial and civil laws, and the Gentiles not practicing that. And then... Uh, it, just in summary and looking forward to the study of this book, uh, Dr. Ross gave sort of two applications for us. He said, Christians can't unite in their mission if they can't unite in the church. If we're not of one mind here, we're not going to be able to have a united mission out there, taking God's gospel to the world. So that... And then restated in a similar way. We have to be united together in the gospel in order to work for the gospel. So th those are helpful things to keep in mind about what Paul is doing and where Paul is coming from uh, in this letter. Now, um, some particulars about this greeting that we have here before us. Everything I've said so far has mostly covered any of Paul's greetings. Um, but now I want to consider just a few unique aspects of this particular greeting. And uh, there's one commentator who urges us not to look past the introduction too quickly. He says, this part of the book is not something to hurry past to get to the good stuff of Romans. This introduction should be carefully digested. It sets the stage for all that follows. First, what we see in these seven verses is that Jesus Christ sits firmly at the center of Paul's faith and life. Jesus Christ is at the center of Paul's faith and life. First, in verse 1, Paul says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. Paul is effectively saying here what he'll say more explicitly elsewhere. I, um, uh, that, that he is, um, oh, I just lost it. I had it for a second. But the idea that, um, that we are not our own, but that we belong to Christ, that our every moment of life is devoted in service to him. Uh, the Heidelberg Catechism. Question number one says, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And the answer, it's actually a long answer, which I didn't realize until I looked it up, but the first part of the answer says this. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but I belong body and soul in life and death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. That is what Paul is communicating here when he says he is a servant of Jesus Christ. Well, beyond that, Paul says that God's gospel is all about Jesus Christ. Um, so Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning who? His son. His son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. God's gospel is all about Jesus Christ. The prophets wrote about it beforehand. Um, it, God had promised him through their writings that he would come. Jesus came and he endured humiliation in his incarnation 
and his death. But more than that, Jesus received exaltation through his resurrection and his ascension to the right hand of God the Father. God's gospel is all about Jesus Christ. Well, after that, we see that God gave grace and apostleship through Jesus Christ. Verse 5, through whom, through Christ our Lord, we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God gave grace and apostleship through Jesus Christ. All that was necessary for the gospel to go forth from Jerusalem, from Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. God gave it all through Jesus Christ, the, the Savior he appointed, not only for Israel, but for his people in all the world. Um, everything necessary to reach the nations with the gospel came through Jesus Christ. Well, these are all the explicit ways, but then there's a fourth and less explicit way that, um, that we see Christ being central for Paul. And that's that we see him named four times in this one introduction. We see the name Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus four times here. Now, what's the significance of that? It's not just, oh, Paul talks about Jesus a lot here in the beginning. But there's actually a significance to the number four. Four times, is, four is one of those numbers that, um, that emphasizes uh, really universality. That Christ is the, the whole of everything that Paul is doing. He encompasses every aspect of it. That if there's anything that Paul's doing that is not ultimately to serve Jesus Christ, he doesn't want anything to do with that. Everything in Paul's uh, mission, everything in his work, everything in his life and ministry is devoted to Jesus Christ. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. Um, his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, you who are called to belong to Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ sits squarely at the heart, at the very center of all of Paul's life and ministry. <clears throat> and I have five minutes to do all of this next section, which means I'm not going to do this the, the whole section. But, um, but the second thing I wanted us to think about in these seven verses is that the gospel of Jesus Christ, so first, Jesus Christ sits squarely at the center of Paul's life and ministry. And then second, the gospel of Jesus Christ comes right out of the pages of the Old Testament. Um, it's right there. Uh, there's actually a scholar, uh, I think his last name's uh, Golding J, Golding Gay, something like that. Um, I forget the, the title of it exactly, but uh, the title of his book is something like, Do We Even Need the New Testament? Now, we really don't want to go to that extreme. Um, there, yes, we do. We need the New Testament. But part of his point in that book is to try to get us to look back at the Old Testament. Um, there is so much about the gospel that God has revealed uh, in the pages of the Old Testament. And, um, and that is what Paul is really going to bring out in the book of Romans. Um, that's something to, to keep your eye out for as we go through this series, as Dr. Ross particularly teaches, is Paul is just going to be centered in all these texts of Scripture uh, in the Old Testament uh, because the gospel of Jesus Christ comes right out of the pages of the Old Testament. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk 
big picture here for just a few minutes. So, um, so in verse 1, set apart for the gospel of God. What's that word gospel mean? I think, I think we all probably know this. It means good news. The word in Greek is euangelion. Um, the, it gets translated, transliterated into English through our word evangelism. Um, uh, uh, EU means good. Um, angel means message or news. Um, and so we are sharing the gospel when we're doing evangelism, the, the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, that word is used in the Old Testament um, on a number of occasions. Uh, usually where it appears the most is actually as a verb form that says, uh, I will preach the good news. Let me look up one really quick that is uh, significant in Isaiah 61. Um, this is a prophecy of Jesus. Uh, Isaiah 61, 1 to 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Notice that, like we were talking earlier, the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. The word actually is to gospel preach, to preach the gospel, to, to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. So this idea of good news is there. Uh, in the pages of the Old Testament. Um, Jesus is promised beforehand in so many different texts in the Old Testament. Um, even though this is in the New Testament, I want to read Acts chapter 2 because here Peter cites an Old Testament text. He cites Psalm 16. But this is Acts 2, 29 to 32. This is the Apostle Peter. He says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to start back at verse 25 because Peter actually reads Psalm 16. For David says concerning him, that is Jesus, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Okay, thus far, that's just Psalm 16. That's just Peter citing Psalm 16. Now listen to what Peter says about Psalm 16. He says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried. And his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Here we see in Psalm 16 a, a promise beforehand this expectation that a descendant of David would come and would rise uh, from the dead. And, um, and so, friends, that is, our, uh, that is our hope, that the gospel didn't just uh, show up. It didn't just get created by the early church. But the gospel is, the gospel of Jesus Christ comes right out of the very pages of the Old Testament. And, now, the, the Jewish Christians at the Church of Rome especially are worried that, that Paul is not preaching the Old Testament rightly. But part of his goal in this letter to the church at Rome will be to, to show them how, uh, how he is. Uh, the gospel he is preaching is the true gospel, and it's the gospel that is consistent with all of the scriptures, all of the word of God that they have been given. And so, um, so I encourage you, uh, th thank you all so much for being here this morning. Um, ho hopefully, uh, my teaching was helpful in a number of ways, but I promise you, Dr. Ross is going to be so much better, so don't go away. Um, please, uh, please come back.
again to this class as we continue to study uh, God's word together. But let me close this in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and our Lord. Thank you um, for your servant, the Apostle Paul, and for all uh, that you gave him to write, not only to the church at Rome, not only to the other churches in his time, but that you also gave to him to write to us, that these words are beneficial for us right now. Um, And they are just as true now as they were then. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who inspired these words and who gives them to us authoritatively, who has preserved your word to this very day. And, uh, And Lord, we pray that as we go from this place that we would be Trinitarian people who who love you as our Father, who come to you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Mediator, and who do so through the power of your Holy Spirit who dwells with us, in us and with us, that, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, you are never far away from us. You are always very close. Help us not to forget that. Help us to reach out to you in the midst of this week Uh, in in the midst of the trials and the difficulties we run into, not to forget that you are right there with us. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us, your people. And we pray that you would strengthen us for uh, the the different uh, responsibilities and activities that you have for us to do this week. May we do it all uh, for your honor and glory. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.